Hello, everybody. And depending on where you are in the United States, it could be Sunday, April 7th, or Monday, April 8th. This yeah. <laughs> is the official end of the longest weekend of the wrestling calendar year. This is your WrestleMania postgame show right here in the audio section of PWInsiderElite.com. I'm Mike Epsonhart. He's Dave Scherer. And we're here to talk about WrestleMania. And and before we get rolling, you know what's very interesting here? On Friday night, we went a little over three hours. Right, We did three hours plus. Last night, we did five hours plus. Tonight... Seven hours plus. And 854 <laughs> hours plus. It's a long time, man. I got to tell you. Um, yeah, I mean, like right off the bat, if, if, if you're doing the old school, you know, should, should I watch the replay, buy the replay, whatever the replay? Um, in my opinion, there's a lot of really good stuff on the show, uh, that, you, that you'll want to watch. It was certainly better than I expected it to be. It's no secret that I was, uh, uh, less than enamored with the the build to this show going in, um, but as Epps and I were just talking about before we came on the air, you get to a certain point in the night, and and you know what? God bless every single one of you that are back on the East Coast at that show, and even watching it at home. But certainly those that are watching at the show that had it in you to to get fired up for the main event, which you know it shouldn't have been an issue to do. But my God, by the time they got there, you guys had been there a long time. Yeah, I mean, the reality is, I thought it was a good show. Going back to the build one last time, if my ankles were healthy and I could have gone out and not worried about kind of regressing or hurting myself or being uncomfortable out and about in Los Angeles, I would not have watched the show today. I'm still in a place where being laid up in bed is probably the best thing for me, so if I was going to be laying in bed anyway... I was going to watch the show until they did something, like I talked about all weekend long, until they did something that made me go, nope, I'm out of here. They did not. They did not. Again, the only thing, and I've been saying this for the entire time they've gone to this marathon format, it doesn't matter how good it is, there gets to a certain point of the night where it doesn't matter who's in the ring, how hard they're working, and how good the match is. And I'm on the West Coast, where I'm just As like, am I. As am I. Let's just wrap this thing up and go home, everybody, because it's way too long. And even the live crowd. You got to the Kofi Kingston moment where everyone was rocking and that building was going crazy. And really, if you look at the timing of the show from the beginning of the pre-show to Kofi Kingston winning the championship, that's really probably a long pay-per-view right there. And then there were still two hours left after that. And the crowd was kind of gone from that point on. Because that's the energy you expend. And when you're in that building with all those people and you're all rocking and rolling, you expel that energy and you expel that emotion and you get to that crescendo and you kind of go, all right. And sometimes you can rally again, but when your main event is starting at midnight local time, it's asking a lot to ask 80,000 people that have been there since, you know, six hours, get it, six and a half hours. Yeah, because the pre-show plus started getting here at two, build. at two, so it started there at five. So you got to think you at least that's they're going before. through traffic. Plus yeah. they're trying to get to the building. Plus they've had a whole weekend worth of events. Right. Because that's the other thing. You know, even if you just went to WWE events, you've got TakeOver, the Hall of Fame, Access all the other little pop-up things they're doing all around New York, and then finally you get to WrestleMania. It's hard. It's, it's a lot. You know, I really do think, because I don't think, honestly, the, the live crowd will be disappointed if the show ended two hours earlier. I really think for the sake of the performers and the sake of the impact that the moments have, they need to shorten the shows. You know, you go back to some of the classic WrestleManias where you get to the main event, where the crowd is going crazy. Those are three and a half hour, four, four and a half hour shows. Yeah, I mean, they used to fit in that three hour window. I mean, they had to be off the air by, you know, what, it used to be like 1040 and then, you know, back on the east. And then it turned, you know, they, you could get right up to 11 o'clock. But it's like, 
it's just so much. I mean, and you're like, and you're right. You know, I mean, this is, it's no secret I wasn't a big fan of, of the build to get us to, to the main event. Uh, you know, I certainly thought that, that it should have just been, uh, Becky and Rhonda and, you know, um, they, they gave you that at the end where it was Becky and Rhonda, but, for all of 31 seconds. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't what I wanted, but, but, you know, and you can make the case that, you know, Charlotte was a working machine in there because she was. But the bottom line is, I mean, it was not a big, exciting build for me. But with that said, once we got here, I, I wanted to see it. I wanted to see Becky, you know, assume her rightful place, uh, you know, at, at the top of the throne. And I wanted her to, you know, to have her moment and blah, 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 blah. But, I mean, by the time we got there, you know, and, and, and you know, she came out and you said to me, you know, she, she's not getting the pop she should get, and it's true, and it wasn't her fault. It's just, you know, how much can you pop after a while? You know, it's just like, I mean, it's like, damn, dude, I'm tired. You know, I, I want to go to bed. I'm old. You know, and 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 it's it, there was, and for us, like you said, you know, we're we're out here in the West, so for us, it's not as big of a deal. But my God, if I was sitting in that stadium, I'd have had some anger in me. I got to tell you, I'd have been like, come on, man. I would have been the old, you know, Chris Carter. Come on, man. Because then you also got to worry about now it's this late. Now I got how long is it going to take me to get back to my hotel? You know, you're in a especially you're in a foreign city that you really aren't don't spend a lot of time with, and you start to worry about well, how long is it going to take me to get back to my hotel? Now there's eighty two thousand people here. The last train actually leaves from Jersey ten minutes after that final bell. Eighty two thousand people. You don't know how many of them relied on the train to get to the building to get to the, the, the stadium you know you can't fit all those people in one car it's a lot of people to put in 82,000 yeah, 82, so 000. if you get out of the building in time to get to the last train you have to be among the lucky first group to get there so the second the three count went people who took public transportation were out they were running because even getting out of, so there's all this stress that comes into then how do I get back to the hotel? Oh, now I got to pay for an Uber. How much does that is that if I have to go? Will all there the way even back, be an Uber here at twelve thirty yeah. in the morning in the metal? I mean, and what, for those that don't know, the metal land surge price with eighty two thousand people. Right, I'm going to pay like eighty dollars to go a mile. And and yeah. again, you know, the metal. They keep talking about New York City. You're in the shadow of New York City, but mm-hmm. the Meadowlands is it, the Meadowlands is a swamp in the south. And you know, as Bruce Springsteen always said, it's a swamp of Jersey. I mean, because that's what it is. And you know, it's it's not like you're in New York. You're you're in the swamps of Jersey, and yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> and if you don't know the geography of New York, New Jersey, and you booked an early flight the next morning, thinking, oh, once the show ends, I'll get back to the hotel in ten minutes. We'll get a quick, you know, few hours of sleep, and then head off to the airport. That start, starts to mess with you too, because now you're like, oh my god, wait a second. I booked a seven a.m. flight. It's At this point, you might as well just go to LaGuardia and wait. Yeah, you know? seriously. Let's all see. kidding aside. Yeah, I, I gotta go back to the hotel because my, my bags are there. So now I gotta do that and then just head off to the airport. All these things come into play for human beings. Yeah, I, I like I, I understand what WWE is trying to do. They're making this amazing festival of wrestling, and they're giving you every last drop of what you pay for. So I'm not like going, "Oh, you dummies," or anything like that. But I think you have to reevaluate that strategy for the overall good of the product and the fans. Yeah, and to, to to reiterate your point and, and to go in a, a little bit of a different same direction kind of thing, we've been waiting all year, or at least for a long time, to see Ronda Rousey and Becky Lynch. You know, and mm-hmm. of course, you know, you put Charlotte in the mix, and like we talked about, you and I, you know, on the air and off the air. But the time, I mean, at first it was like, man, Becky came out and that crowd's dead. You know, and and if that if she would have came out two hours earlier or been lucky enough to have been put in the Brock Lesnar position, Seth Rollins position, where it was a surprise that it went on first, they'd have been you know hanging from the rafters in that building. But it's like after seven plus hours, it's like okay, you know, th- this thing started at at four o'clock and it's you know. I guess it was, uh, what, two, it was started here at two, so it started five. So, mm-hmm. five o'clock, and it's midnight. I've been, I've been in this seat for seven hours, except to like go take a leak and go get something to eat. I'm burned, man. I just, I want this thing to, and it's like, and you know how it is. We, you know, we've been at shows that went too long. We're just like, I loved every minute of this until I just got really tired. I just want this to end. I want to go to sleep, you know, and, and it's, it, it's a shame. That that's something that they built to that they made such a big you know a big deal out of and and rightfully so that this is going to be the first time the women ever main evented WrestleMania and it's like the longest WrestleMania ever and it's kind of like you know 
is that really is that really you know uh, something that you want to have given to you, or would you rather be on when Daniel Bryan and I mean Daniel Bryan and Kofi, you know they achieved perfection and. You know, they got to go home, and then there's still two more hours to go. You know, it's like, I would have rather have been, you know, had... And again, you know, you obviously have to see everything that comes after. But if that would have been when the main event, that would have been the time to end the show. And you still have all this time still to go. And as a fan, you know, in addition to the time that you're sitting there for seven plus hours, you also, you had that Kofi moment, which was like, you know, and and they booked that perfectly. You know, we'll talk about that when we get to it. But it's like, you had this moment with Kofi where it's like, you know... Oh, they're going to screw him. They're going to screw him. He fought back. He won. Yeah. And, you, and, and like you mentioned earlier, you exerted all that, that, that juice you have and all that emotion. And whenever you get to a super high, there's a low that comes after it. And, you know, the, the more tired you get, the later it gets in the day, the harder it is to keep hitting that high. It's just, you know, it's, it's, it just becomes less and less and less. And it was a shame that that happened, you know, and, and the match was, you know, it was very physical, the main event. Um, it wasn't a classic, in my opinion, by any means. But even if it was, I don't think the crowd would have been able to react mm-hmm. to it as, you know, the way they did to, to Brian and, and, and to Kofi because they were burned. And it's it's just a long day. It's a long day for them. It's a long day and it's a long weekend. And once that, that adrenaline dumps after that release of the Kofi moment, it's like, oh, man, I really want to get it back. Like, I, And I'm sure the fans weren't sitting there going... So, you know, I'm sure there's a portion of the crowd that's like, oh, I can't wait to get out of here at this point. But I would get, guarantee you probably the massive percentage of the crowd was like, oh, man, I would love to cheer for this. I just I don't have it in me right now. I just oh, – maybe if I – you know, maybe if we just chill out for a little while and, you know, ignore kind of Batiste and Triple H and ignore Finn and, and the Demon and uh, ignore the Demon and, and Bobby Lashley and – Maybe we can rally for the main event, and they tried. There was like a Becky chant during the introductions. I was like, "Oh, maybe they are going to rally," and then that was like it. They're like done. They was like, "Nah, not it, really." It's tough, and I've already gotten twenty emails from you know elites and other readers that are like, "Too long. I'm so tired." And they're back east. I mean, for you and me, it's quarter of ten, right? It's quarter mm-hmm. one for them. You know, it's like it's it's a long day, and also it's Sunday night. You got to go yeah. to work the next day, yeah. so it'd it be. Like, oh, by the know, way, Stu Carapole is not with us. He was supposed to be with us. Uh, his allergies kicked in, and frankly, you know, again, it's quarter of one back where he is. And and you know, I had even said to him beforehand, dude, you don't have to do the show. It's 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 a lot, and he has to work tomorrow, just like you yeah. said. So that's why which uh, which me- meant that even if I wanted to bail, I couldn't have at I that know. point because I was the final. <laughs> you are. You were the last one I had, and the best part was. <laughs> You know, I knew you couldn't bail because you told me I'm going to hang in there until they piss me off, and I knew you never left. So it's like I was like, kid, you're stuck with me. You, you got to be here. It's you and me. But you know, all that being said about the length, it's a thumbs up show. Absolutely, um, way better it's than I expected. Absolutely, thumbs up show. Yep. If you have the network, you can break it up into parts into four days. Four days, everybody. That. Four days. No, I'm just kidding. Th- two days for sure, though. Maybe yeah. three. It was a couple a hours each day. Yeah. It, was a, it was a lot. It really was a lot. Huh. And and I was cru- – but now, again, you know, when I talked to a friend of mine, um, you know, I actually heard from Mike, and he's like, wow, this went too long or that one. I mean, Triple H and Batista, I was still – I was juicing there. I, I enjoy, You know, and we'll talk about that. But I was like – but I was thinking to myself yeah, – Dave was gigging himself. He was juicing, oh, bleeding all over bleeding the place. Around, yeah, I, I got blood on my arm and my <laughs> head. And I ripped out my nose ring just like Batista did. Um but but I'm thinking, you know, this is pretty cool. But then I looked at the clock and I'm like, okay, so this is 10:30, and you know you still have a, a decent amount more to go. I'm like, y- y- you do feel the. I mean, you got to come down at some point because it's it's a lot. It's just it's a lot, and they're never going to break it up into two days. So I really think, you know, and, and do we really need the the battle royals? Not really. I mean, here's the deal: cut it back to a one hour pregame show, take an hour off the other end. Instead of making this thing a total of seven and a half hours, cut it at five and a half. You and I watched uh, the New Japan G1 show, uh, G1 Ring of Honor show last night, and it was over five hours, but we weren't gassed by the end. We were like, we could have done a post-game show last night and been fine because it, it, they kept us in the sweet zone. It was like 5.15, I think it was, with an hour pregame show. And that was... That yeah, was they, and they bumped it right up to the very edge, yeah. I think. I think anything more than what they gave us, it would have started to go, all right, boys, yeah. we're done here. So they, they get, I think they went right to the limit of what you really can do. And, and really, you know, if they did another one and it wasn't the first time ever in Madison Square Garden, the first time we've ever seen Ring of Honor in New Japan in the U.S. in front of 20,000 people, we might have been saying the same thing an hour, you know, before we got to, you know, the main event. So it's a long time. they got to be cognizant of that. 
But um, like I said, overall a thumbs up show. Uh, you know, the pre-show started with the cruiserweight championship. Lo- oh, and the one thing before we get into the uh, matches by match breakdown, I have to compliment WWE's booking of the show because what they did do, understanding the length of the show, is they went, you know what, we're not going to do anything crazy tonight. We're not going to do anything unpredictable just to shock people. We're going to give everyone happy endings. Yes, there was a lot. Almost everyone got a happy yeah. ending. Not everybody, but almost. Everything that should have been a happy ending was. They didn't Russo us with like, oh, we swerved you to, to, to make you go, oh. No, it was, it was like, it was a culmination kind of show. Which is what it should have been. Right. And, and so, you know, big thumbs up for not trying to outthink themselves and really doing the right thing for the most part, booking-wise, all night long. Uh, so we started the pre-show with local product, Tony Nice, who, uh, Again, another guy that left Thatcher booked back in 2013 for the Wrestling Cares tournament. Uh, David Jackson was wise to something, but it just wasn't how to make money. <laughs> it wasn't how to spend. <laughs> those are those, no, no, Wrestling Cares had a ton of great matches, very bad promotion, and therefore didn't make any money, and David Jackson left the business. But the the work and the wrestlers, and Les Thatcher was the booker, and the work and the wrestlers were, were outstanding. And as you mentioned last night, um, we're... we're this morning, or no, it was yesterday morning. I can't even remember. After it was the end of half days ago, yeah, it was like uh, it was like back when I was a young man and not an old man. Um, Johnny Gargano and Adam Cole were in the finals of that tournament. So you know, less less knew knew what good was for sure back in the day when he saw these guys. You know, years ago. So yeah, I mean, it, it was it was yeah. Go ahead. We get Tony Nice, uh, the local product, uh, challenging the dominating. Cruiserweight champion Buddy Murphy, uh, and really good action, you know. And it's one of those things where it's awesome for Tony Nese to be on that WrestleMania stage. It's awesome for Buddy Murphy to be on that WrestleMania stage. There is a little bit of sadness that people are still filing to the yeah. building while these guys are kicking ass out there. Absolutely. Although it did this year look like a lot more, more full, but it, it did, and I and I took notice of that because I feel I complain about that every time that you know why. You're never going to get people to care about the cruiserweight title when you put it on the pre-show, and and they've already done a disservice to it. But at least this year, I don't know why they were in their seats earlier than you know than they were in the past. But at least they were there to see it, and it was a great match. Uh, they, it was a really guys, good match. Yeah, they, and they had a fantastic match. The, a complete reversal of what Vince McMahon usually does. The local boy comes out on top and wins the, the cruiserweight championship at WrestleMania, and. Uh, Really good, and I, I'm looking forward to seeing what Tony Nese does with the championship now, because this is a guy who has been... It's one of those things where even years ago, it was like, he looks great, he, he looks strong, he's athletic as hell, he gets it, like, he you know, he does all the stuff in between the moves. When is this guy going to get a break? So it was really, really nice to see him have this moment, and it was a really good match. Yep, absolutely. And, and, you know, Tony Nese is a guy that, you know, like a lot of guys out there that is, especially some that sign with WWE and, and get into the system that, you know, they can do so much more than they've been given. And you hope that, you know, that he gets the chance to do a resurgence like Buddy Murphy does. Now, Buddy Murphy, obviously, you know, I would hope he, you know, that they would let those guys go at it again because it was really good. But I think at this point now, if it's me and I'm Triple H, I say to myself, you know, I've been talking a long time about moving talents around. And and obviously, Buddy Murphy was a guy that, that got into, you know, the, the now burned by Enzo cruiserweight division. I'm going to see if I can take him back to NXT because this guy's good. I'm going to see if I can make him a player. Maybe he comes in and attacks Johnny Gargano, you know, and, and I put him in a title feud with Johnny Gargano or, or something along those lines because Buddy Murphy – You know, he was a guy that was in a tag team for years, and you know, you never got to see much. But Triple H obviously knew what the guy could do because he's great. And and I want to see, you know, I hate to say I want to see him leave 205 Live because, you know, it it sucks to say that. But 205 Live's still in that kind of dead fish territory. So I I want to see Buddy Murphy get more of a chance. And I don't know why he's not on the main roster. It's not he doesn't look like a cruiserweight. He's a you know. Good looking, well built guy that can wrestle his ass off. So it's like I hope I hope this is a springboard for both him and Tony Nese to bigger and better things. And also on the pre show we had the women's battle royal and uh, I, I gotta say it. Uh, why is the trophy shaped like a uterus? 
because women have uteruses, I guess. I, I, I the first thing, like nothing. even last year with Naomi, I'm like, really? And I figured, okay, that's some weird, odd coincidence. They'll clearly change the trophy for next year because someone will be like, um, it's kind of shaped like the diagram of a uterus. But no, same trophy comes back this year. So either it's just a giant rib, or so someone in WWE you listen to this doesn't, doesn't know what a uterus is. I get it. Women. It could be they don't know what a uterus is. <laughs> Nobody <true>. knows. <laughs> I don't know, man. I, I got so, but you're right. I mean, I just I don't know why no one would notice that. It, it's, of it's course, if you look at if you look at the logo for PWInsider.com, dot com, it's a, you know it's a giant penis. It's, like, it's a giant, <laughs> giant penis. I mean, yeah. So you know, it, it's a pre show battle royal. It's just one of those things where, hey, you've been touring for us and beating up your body. So here you are. It's WrestleMania. Have fun. So. There's not a lot of analysis to do of it. You know, I know people were freaking out because they feel like Asuka got screwed over losing the championship and then she can't even win the battle royal. Well, if you were complaining that she was in a meaningless battle royal anyway, who cares that she got thrown out? And historically, battle royals are places where the stars, unless you were doing the Andre the Giant gimmick where he's the king of the battle royal because he's a giant, it's historically a place where the top Raleigh won it a couple of years ago. Yeah. Where's he now? Looking in but, a mirror, wondering why he's a loser. But historically in wrestling, battle royals were the places where your top guys can get thrown over the top rope because it doesn't hurt them to fly over the top rope. That happens during regular matches. And you could take a mid-card guy and have them win. And in this case, it's a little more than a mid-card person. It's Carmella, uh, who is the fake New Yorker. So now New York is two for two on the pre-show. Fake and, you, and you were worried that would mean they'd go two for three, but that didn't happen. Yeah, well, I, I was worried that this was a big setup by Vince going, oh, I'm going to give you a couple of New York happy endings, and then I'm just going to pull the rug out from you. But he didn't do it to us, no. so thank you, Vince. And really, I mean, what was the point of making the the uh, Raw Tag Team title match with, with you know Hawkins and Zach if they weren't going to win? I mean, right. it, their hometown, it's like there was no play in it. It just kind of got thrown together at the last minute. And, and, you know, ordinarily I'd be like, oh, that's ridiculous. A guy that hasn't won in almost a year or whatever it's been, you know, wins the titles. But the Revival have been booked so poor. And I love the Revival, but they've been booked so poorly. You know, it's like, what's it matter if they win or lose anyway? They lost non-title to Ricochet. And, you know, Ricochet and Aleister Black a couple weeks ago and then you know, had to hang on just to beat them, you know, and, and beat them by count out or whatever it was this past week. So it's no big deal. Yeah, they've won like two matches in the last six months, yeah. so. And one of them was for the titles, to win it, so. Yeah, I mean, and they, they try to do a little bit of a setup on dot com with this where the revival escaped with the count out win over Ricochet and Aleister Black and they were backstage feeling good about themselves and, Zach and Kurt kind of walk up to them and, and they're like, hey, why don't you give us a shot at the, at MetLife, at WrestleMania in our hometown? And they kind of laughed it off, but then they're like, well, you know, we want to be on WrestleMania and we, and our number one contenders are fighting for the SmackDown title, so yeah, fine, we'll do it. And obviously the story of the match was the Revival were the superior team. The Revival were a step ahead of them the whole time because Zach and Kurt have not really fared too well, both in singles and tag teams. And Kurt Hawkins gets hit with a devastating brain buster on the floor, and Dawson thinks that's it. There's no way. This kid's done. Rolls him back in the the ring, preens and taunts just a little bit too long and plays around just a little bit too long. Gets caught in the small package for the one, two, three, and the losing streak is broken. And Ryder, once again, shocks the world uh, at WrestleMania winning a championship out of nowhere. It'll probably lose tomorrow or next week. Yeah. yeah. Revival will probably win it back tomorrow. But but that's not the that's, point. <laughs> yeah. You I mean, the unfortunately, moment. the tag titles at this point, um, especially the Raw tag titles, just don't really matter that much. So it's you can do that. Yeah, you get the feel-good moment tonight. The The live crowd gets the pop for it. It doesn't really move the revivals down any lower than they were. It doesn't move the tag team titles down any lower than they were. So there's nothing wrong with doing it. I mean, I wish the revival and the tag team championships were treated better. Maybe since Dash uh, knocked out the jerk that uh, jumped Brett, Vince will be like, oh, I like this guy. He's a tough guy. You know, starting Monday, we're going to do a lot more with these guys because they're really tough. But, you gotta uh, change your name though. I don't like Dash. What kind of name? That, that's a, that's something I put I like on my wilder. Meat. You're just wilder now. Yeah, you're just wilder because you get in his way, he'll go wilder on you. <laughs> Dash, that's like something that's fake salt. I don't like that. 
But again, they told a really good story in the match, and and I'm happy for R- Ryder and Hawkins because these are two guys. Ryder, we've told his story so many times. Someone who's really has deserved better over the years, and Hawkins is a good wrestler who kind of. It looked like he was going to get brought back in with a little bit of juice behind him with the face the facts thing and all the vignettes before he came back and kind of he showed up and it was like you know what nah yeah. never mind <laughs> it's just like yeah I see why I let you go you don't you don't do it for me I don't like your face so it was a good moment for those guys and you yeah. can see the emotion on their faces when the bell rang and the revival did a great job of like just selling like the kind of the shock and disbelief and like screaming at the referee that there's no way there was a three count and so it was good stuff. And then you had the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. And I think everyone knew what the story of this match was going to be. The the SNL guys hiding and running for their lives and Braun tearing through everyone else to get to them. And that's what we got. And that's what they sold us on. So you can't really be upset about that. I mean, and and the fact that Braun was in this match to begin with, you know, when, frankly, he deserves so much better given, you know, his his status in the company. He's phenomenal. Yeah, and he he was jacked, man. I mean, he he is his. I don't know what he's been doing, but he's definitely like in the best shape I've ever seen him in. There's no there's no extra weight. I mean, I want to be very uh, uh, I want to say that the right way. There's no extra weight at all, and he uh, he looked great. And uh, it came down to you know frickin' frack. We're hiding under the ring the whole match, and um, at the end when the Hardy Boys are trying to get uh, Braun out of the ring. Um, all of a sudden, they come in and try to steal the win, and Braun's like, not so fast, and basically, <clears throat> uh, Michael Che tries to eliminate himself, and he's like, again, not so fast, uh, so he throws him out, and then the other, what's his name, Jost, Colin Jost, whatever his yep. name is, um, he comes and does his thing, and, and you know, basically, Braun throws him into next week, and and it throws him out of the crowd on, on all the guys there, and, and, he's, and he wins the, under the giant battle royal. And hopefully the new, you know, the the build that he has now is is going to lead him to a spot where I think he believe he deserves to be and you know used better. We'll see. Yeah, it's going to be interesting because, and obviously they did the match a few times, but it felt like he was the natural guy because of the way he looks and the way he moves and the way he carries himself. That he was the natural guy if Roman wasn't around to take out Brock. And now Seth is the champion. So where does that leave Braun? You know. Because you have Finn as the IC champ, you've got Seth as the Universal champ. So, so where does that leave Braun right now? We're going to find out. And now it's on to the main show. Uh, a really great rendition of America the Beautiful mm-hmm. by Yolanda Adams. We got a cool flyover. Alexa Bliss comes out as the host of the show and says, "I can give you a WrestleMania moment with the snap of my fingers." And out came the Hulkster. And, and, and the only problem with with they, they made it like. Alexa was going to do a lot on the show, on the pre-show, and she didn't get to do much, and that sucks. But at least she wasn't putting a... But I'm glad she didn't, because that would have made the show longer. <laughs> That's true. That is true. But I don't know if that was their intent. But yeah, but but yeah, I mean, it, it's she's so good, and at least they put her in a position where she didn't have to like be in the you know in the battle royal or whatever. It's like okay, you know, we'll put you in a better position than that because she is good, and we'll see where they go with her now that she's hopefully back to being able to wrestle. So we had our great unintentional comedy moment of the night where Hulk Hogan does the, the, the hey, it's the Silverdome joke playing off of WrestleMania 30, but then still gets the MetLife building yeah. name wrong. What do you call it? The MetLife something? I forget what it was. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he called it like, the, he, he called it something Center really building. weird, like the yeah. MetLife Entertainment Center or something yeah. like that. Like, it was like, no, it, it's MetLife Stadium, yeah. Hulk. Yeah. I was so like, he blew yeah. the name anyway. Yeah, because he's balls deep in Brooke. Oh, come on, dude. I'll never forget that. So we weren't going to do that. <laughs> well, no, I mean, that's that's Hogan, though. It's like, you know, he, he retweets things like, you know, someone's like, hey, oh, bold steep in your daughter, and he retweets it because he doesn't get it. And the same thing happened tonight. I'm going to make a joke about my screw-up and make another screw-up. That's Hogan. You know, and we'll report this, that Big E tweeted that he had a discussion with Hogan, and Hogan apologized, and B- Big E said we're going to move on, and well, he's going to give that. Hogan that's a second cool. chance. Oh, good. I didn't hear that. Yeah, so, you know, if, and that's what I was waiting for. I was waiting for those guys to kind of go, okay, we bless this before I stop mocking Hogan relentlessly. So now that those guys are starting to come out and say, hey, we're going to move forward from this, I accept his apology, we had a discussion, now I'm a, a little more willing to lay off of Hogan. 
Um, so Hogan gives the big, we got all the Stark Raven Hulkamaniacs here, brother. And they start to do the pose down with Alexa. Which was funny. It was cool. Mm-hmm. She looked like she was having fun. She was having a good time. Yeah, you could see. And Paul Heyman comes marching out to, while Real American's playing and power walks his way to the ring to say, Brock thinks this show's too long, too. Mm-hmm. And if we're not going on last, we ain't waiting around. We're going because on. Because he's going to go to Las Vegas where he's ultimately respected. Yeah. Okay. That, that was a smart Mark way of saying UFC for everybody. That we're not, we're not going to say UFC because it's a shoot, brother. Brother. So Paul introduces Brock. Brock comes out. Seth accepts that we're going to do the match right now. He comes out. Really a hot, hot open. It was everything it should have been, and it didn't need to be anything more. Brock jumps on Seth before Seth can get in the ring. He beats the living crap out of him, F5s him on the floor, hurls him over a table, just beats the crap out of Seth, and then finally rolls him back in the ring, and the referee calls for the official start of the match, and Seth's in trouble. And we start going to Suplex City, and he goes for the F5, and Seth gets over his back and shoves him. The referee dives out of the way, but since the referee had to turn his back and kind of dive out of the ring to avoid getting run over by Brock, Seth low blows him, hits him with three curb stomps. One, two, three, we're out. New Universal Champion Seth Rollins, and the crowd went crazy. Mm-hmm. Like I said, it didn't need to be anymore. That didn't need to be a 20-minute classic. That was perfect. And, and you know, for those of you who are like, oh, I want to see Brock do more and all, or, or whatever... Brock, uh, while Seth won the title, Brock laid flat on his back for a long time, which, you know, you never see. I mean, Seth made it all the way up to the, to the, you know, he walked all the way up to the stage. You know, he's, he's up on the stage. He's holding the title up. Brock, at that point, is just up on one arm. So Brock sold the three Kurt stomps for a while and, and, you know, gave Seth his moment. Um, and again, you know, you could say whatever you want about Brock having the title, and we have, but at the end of the day, it was Vince McMahon's call. And if someone's going to mm-hmm. say, I'm going to pay you a lot of money and, and give you everything you want, and you're not going to have to do a lot, most people are going to say, cool, great deal, I'll take it. So yep. you, know, you can't blame Brock for, for taking what was given to him, but you can't blame us for being sick of it. So now, provided they don't do something crazy on Raw tomorrow, um, at least when the insipid briefcase comes around uh, next month, the guy carrying it will at least have a champion on TV he can cash in at any time on. And, uh, you know, you, uh, you know, I'm not, the low blow isn't a big deal either because the reason he used the low blow is because yeah. Brock jumped him. Right. He did and, one low blow. Brock hit him about 30 times. So yeah. that, that was more than fair. So that was the baby face going, all right, if you're going to cheat, I'm going to cheat. So yeah, it wasn't he, like, he was evening the odds, really. Yeah. So it wasn't Seth just getting mauled fair and square and going, oh my god, the only way I could beat this monster is by hitting him in the balls. It was, no, I, I am a no good cheater too. You forget that my history is I've turned on my own brothers. So if you're going to get dirty with me, look out, pal. Here's what's going to well, happen. I remember how he won the title. Yeah. Cashed in on, on, you know, the whole Roman thing. So yeah. Yeah, so it was a really great start and I was like, alright. And then we, Move to uh, AJ Styles versus Randy Orton, uh, and again a really good match for the second match on the show. The first match set that really hot tone, and now we have our classic wrestling match. And you know they went back and forth. Uh, they worked really well together. You know the story of the match was really AJ was ready for the RKO out of nowhere, so he was able to avoid it almost every time. The big move moment was Randy hits the RKO finally uh, late in the match, and AJ is the first guy I think in years, the last guy I remember is Daniel Bryan at WrestleMania 30 to kick out of the RKO. So that's a huge put over of AJ Styles because that's one of the most protected finishes in the entire company. So AJ kicks out of the RKO. He eventually ends up hitting the uh, phenomenal forearm, and one, two, three. AJ Styles is the big winner. And the, these guys worked really hard, you know. I, I put in my blog, and I kind of got this vibe. It was kind of like, you know, and, and part of AJ's deal was, you know, he was trying to, you know, he had to get a new contract before he was going to get, you know, get a push. So 
Um, you know, and, and it kind of seemed like they both thought, oh, you think we're an afterthought? We're going to go out there and tear it up. And they both worked really hard. And with Randy, you know, you, 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 there are times you could get Randy in his, you know, I'm going to work smart mode, I guess for lack of a better term. Uh, he went out there and he, he took a lot of abuse. He worked really hard and, and, you know, he, he put over, I, I don't want to say the young guy because AJ is actually older than Randy is, but, you know, he went out there and, and, you know, was the guy shooting off his mouth talking about you, this little indie guy wrestling bingo halls. And at the end of the day, uh, he let the, you know, he let the bingo hall guy beat him. Not that he let him, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah, there was an awesome superplex during the match, too, like a yeah. really, like a high altitude superplex. And again, you know, this is the stuff that puts over, you know, guys. Randy hits the RKO, can't beat him with it, so he tries to RKO him off the top and ends up coming back to bite him because, again, that's something Randy doesn't normally have to do. So, like, they, they plus, put together... Plus, a- AJ had, had like, the uh, the DDT scouted out where yep. he's, he slipped through a few times like, you're not getting me with that again. Which I like when they do that because if you get burned with a move two or three times, why, why would you keep getting burned with it? Aren't you gonna, if you don't learn, you're an idiot. So after that good match, we had Lacey Evans come out to do her walk, her twirl, and she left. Yeah. That's what she does. Yeah, I didn't know that I needed to see that, but okay. Yeah, it's like some of those things, like, why, you know, couldn't she have done, it actually would have been a funny spot if they gave her an intro during the Battle Royal, and she just walked away, and they're like, she's supposed to be in the match. Yeah. But, I don't know. It and is what it is. I, I, I mean, again, you know, it's like, we talk all the time about how, Vince runs through angles too fast, and other times he just lets stuff permeate forever and ever and ever. It's like, let's get to the next step of what Lacey Evans is going to do. Yeah, this is starting to feel like Emelina a little bit. Yeah. So we have the SmackDown Tag Team title match, the Usos versus Rusev and Nakamura versus Aleister Black and Ricochet versus The Bar. You know, they went out there, and they basically went to town with, a, you know, it's a four-way tag match, so they went to town with a lot of spots, you know, in and Which out. Is what you should do because, yeah. yeah, because everybody's fresh and everybody realizes, you know, you got to be in the ring to win. So it's like whenever you're in, you go 100 miles an hour. And generally, what ends up happening is you get hit with a big spot. You roll to the outside. It, it, you know, the, these tag team four ways are generally pretty formulaic, so you know what's coming. You know, it's going to be a rash of finishers and big spots, and eventually someone's going to steal a pin. You know, because they're going to finally be able to isolate everyone, and it's kind of what happened. You know, we went through the whole thing. Uh, Cesaro gave Ricochet the Cesaro swing for about 45 minutes. Oh, my God. It just, and, and the whole time, Sheamus is pounding the chest of Aleister Black. And it's like... Everyone. Uh, everyone kept on getting caught in the... Uh, yeah. It was like... But that swing just went on forever. And it's like, I'm yep. thinking, you know, who do you really... I mean, like, obviously, it's impressive that Cesaro can do it. But it's even more impressive that Ricochet can take it. And not and like not get up and like walk into the wall, you know. Yeah, I know. It's like, like, I, I want to know what the secret to not like being completely messed up for like thirty minutes from right. Like, I mean, I get up and I, I remember that you know there's that old football drill where it's like you know they they run the guys in circles and then they get up and they kind of walk sideways and fall down, you know. And Ricochet got right up. He's fine. I'm like that dude's a freak. So they went to the, and there's one thing where they made me go from uh to oh, they did the Tower of Doom spot and I hate it because it's so overused at this point, but. Ricochet is like, I know what's coming, and he rolls through it at the bottom. So the guy at the top of the Tower of Doom was like, because he's such a freak of nature athletically, was like, I'm not getting caught with, again, I'm not getting caught with something I've seen happen a zillion times. So he rolls through to the side of the ring, and he doesn't take any damage. Plus, he saw the other guys coming, so he knew the guys that were trying to throw him didn't know that people were sneaking up from behind. He did, so he's like, oh, I'm going to try to launch the second I can get away from these guys. It It was smart. Yeah, he ends up hitting the 630 on Sheamus, which basically kills Sheamus. There's a big schmaz. Uh, everyone gets ejected from the ring, leaving the Usos in there with Sheamus. They hit the double splash off the top. Still, they overcome Vince McMahon's punishment of them, which I'm glad Vince McMahon did. And Jimmy and Jay overcome, happy ending. Vince McMahon's evil ploys are not working. They are the tag team champions. And it was, again, a, yeah, you know, I mean, exactly what it should have been, and it was, yep. it was fine for that. Absolutely. This match made me laugh, and it shouldn't have, but it did. I just laughed for this entire match. Falls count anywhere, The Miz versus Shane McMahon. Well, I know why you laughed. It's like, uh, and it's like, I mean, you and I have, uh, you know, for new people listening, we're always like, I mean, I get, 
I have a lot of respect that Shane, at you know, 50 years old, will do the stuff that he does to his body for whatever reason. I mean, I wouldn't do any of the stuff he's doing, and I'm a little older than he is. But, I mean, it's like we always talk about how bad his offense is. And how does the match start? He goes in and throws those little chicken punches that don't even touch anything, and Miz has to sell them. They're terrible. You know what it is? He throws punches like a six-year-old who gets frustrated with his older brother. Yeah. Get away from me. Get away from me. Get away from me. Yeah, you wait until his like face turns purple or something. It's like they're so <laughs> terrible. And then he starts throwing kicks that like aren't touching anything. And then when George got in the ring, I'm thinking, well, that- I lost it. Uh, I know, I- but I'm thinking at least Shane won't actually hit him because his punches are so weak. Thank God. But yeah, it was it was. T- and George stands in front of of the table so that you know that that uh, Shane can't. You know, hit, hit the big spot off the top on him. And then, you know, Miz is like so mad. He's beating him up, beating him up, going all around the building, go up to the top where the cameraman is. And, I mean, in what world, if you really <laughs> hate somebody, do you say to yourself, no, I'm not just going to throw this guy to his death. I'm going to go with him. Why in the name of God would you do a suplex where you're going to take the same... You know, even if you win the match, you're going to get abused as much as he is when you could just grab him by the ass and throw him into the same exact spot and then go down and pin him. See, Undertaker, genius. He says, hey, me and Mick Foley are on yeah. the top of the cell here. Only Mick's going down because he's going to die, not me. Oh, we're back on top of the cell? I'm choke slamming him through the cage. Only he's going down, not me. Miz, big idiot. We're on top of this platform... And I have him helpless, and I could just chuck him off, like The Undertaker did to Mick Foley in 1997. I could kick him off. I could punch him off. Yeah. I could do a lot of things. I could kick him off. I could backdrop him off. I could do a million things. I could hip toss him off. I could do a million things that don't involve me falling 20 feet to my death. Right. Only him. But no, I'm going to superplex him. Because, you know, when I give a superplex in the ring, I have to sell that because I'm hitting the mat, too. But... I bet you if I superplex him from you know twenty feet in the sky through a platform, that I'll be fine. Right. So of course he does the superplex, and I and I get what they were going for. The Miz was so enraged that he wasn't thinking. But there comes a point where it's like, how dumb are you that you're that angry that you do something that stupid? To if you're going to do that, he's so enraged he messes up thing. He tries to dive on Shane, and Shane rolls out of the way. Right. Like, he takes a risk. He's doing like Johnny Gargano in NXT, where, yeah. his, where his rage makes him do something stupid that, it, that, that you know, if he would have connected with it, it would have been great. Like you said, no matter what, you know, e- even if it ends up that he lands on top of Shane after they do the spot, he's still laying there for a while because he hurt himself. The whole idea is to hurt Shane, not yourself, dummy. So he superplexes Shane off. Uh, they go off together. They go through the platform. And, of course, Shane lands on top. And Shane's arm is across Miz's chest. So the referee runs down, counts three, and Shane McMahon is your winner. I will say, I thought Miz was really great with what they gave him. Yeah. He, did, right? he made the, chicken salad out of it. Yeah. The the early part of the match was you know him chasing after Shane because he was just so mad at him. Which allowed Shane to get the advantage. I thought, and I will say that, I thought the story they told, it wasn't just Shane McMahon is tougher than everybody. No. We'll get to one spot that made me laugh, but aside from the superplex, but it was that Miz actually is far superior and tougher than Shane is really the story they told, which amazed me, and I thought it was the right story. But Shane ha- is so in his head that he's forcing the Miz. Miz is usually the guy that plays mind games with everyone. And gets everyone all pissed off, but this time it's the, the shoes on the other foot. And because of that, Shane was able to kick his ass a little bit early. Miz's dad got involved, and that made sense because Shane put his hands on Miz's dad during the turn. So Miz's dad gets in the ring to buy Miz some time and does the put him up thing. Shane, like a jerk, kicks the old man in the, in the stomach. Oh no! At, no, at first Shane lifted his his hands up to show him how to actually fight because right, no, no one actually, no yeah. one throws better punches than Shane. Right. Oh, I'm going to show you how to punch. <laughs> it won't hurt me a bit because it might don't hurt anybody. So uh, you know what my favorite Shane, part of this match is? Shane does have this this. Uh, it's kind of like a what was that movie with a Benjamin Button? It's kind of like a like a, a Benjamin Button the other way. Shane comes out to the ring as a guy that looks like he's in his mid forties, and by the time he leaves, it looks like Grandpa Al Lewis from the Monsters. <laughs> it's, it's like he ages twenty years in every match. By the time it's over, it's like his face. All of a sudden, he looks like he's one hundred and fourteen years old. Yeah, there's a little bit of sweat around his eyes when he comes out <laughs> because there's all the powder they put on him. Right. But then, 
like within five minutes, he's just dripping like he was flair in a sixty minute Broadway. And the hair just goes straight, you know, straight to hell. And it's that's what I said. That I, I said on Twitter, Miz just needs to make this match last ten more minutes, and Shane will just pass out from dehydration. Absolutely. And, and, and he sweats like a pig, but he wears this heavy jersey. It's like, dude, you might want to lighten up your shirt a little bit. You know, and you're in great shape. Shirts. You used to wear the jersey because you were, you know, you didn't have the body. Yeah. You have a great body now. You don't need the jersey. Wear a t-shirt. Yeah. Or wear a singlet. Yeah. But anyway, so they fight up on, up on into the crowd and they go up on the platform and Miz hits Shane with the skull crushing finale of the court on a, on a on platform. plywood. Yeah. Yeah. On plywood. And, and Shane kicks out and of I was course. like, well, yeah, that makes sense because all the sweat actually becomes a shield for his face. <laughs> that, that, well, no, so what happened was him. he stood on the plywood long enough that the, that the sweat came off him and it actually sunk into the wood, warped it a little bit, and it made it softer. That's why it didn't hurt. And also, Miz slipped off of him because of all the sweat, <laughs> well, of so he course, couldn't really yes. drive him down into the, 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 the plywood. Yeah. So that made me laugh. But the, the match, I didn't expect it to be... But again, Miz just being angry and beating the living crap out of Shane for most of the match, I thought that was the right way to yeah, go. made sense. So it wasn't offensive, it wasn't good, but I didn't expect... there was like. You do the calculus in your head sometimes, and you're like, here's the booking that's going to really make me angry, and here's the booking that'll make me happy. And I realized, there's no good booking out of this, so it is just going to be what it's going to be. So I wasn't offended by it. It just was what it was. It made me but, laugh. But the problem is, because Shane got the win, it's not over. It's not over. So it just keeps going. Although the McMahon sometimes just do win in the end. That's true, but where does Miz go from here? Who, who's the U.S. champion now? Uh, Joe. <laughs> Joe, yeah, yeah, yeah. Joe. Yeah, I guess. He deserves better. So that was the match. It was kind of hilarious, and I don't think that was supposed to be the reaction I was supposed to have. No, of course not. Then we had our next four-way tag match. It's the Women's Tag Team Championship. The Boston Hug Connection. Oh, I do have to make one point about the the uh, Randy Orton uh, AJ match. Go ahead. Poor Karsten Schaefer. He got like he sp- got speared when Randy threw. Uh, he, <laughs> he got he got speared. Randy, I think, threw AJ into him, and he got wiped. No, that out. was when Brock threw Seth. Or Brock threw Seth. That's right. Excuse me. Yeah. yeah, yeah like, Brock just right. chucked Seth, and he ended up killing yeah. him. Oh, so funny. yeah, we have uh, the Boston Hug Connection, the Divas of Doom, Nia and Tamina. And the Iconics, mm-hmm. uh, you know, during the Divas of Doom entrance, uh, Natty came out first, Beth's music hit, Beth came, Beth came out, and then the Heart Foundation's original music hit. Beth and Natty were dressed in the pink and black. Brett came out to see them off. So for a minute, I was like, you know, the Heart Foundation went to the Hall of Fame, Natty's dad passed away. Wow, Natty and Beth are going to end up winning this thing with the heart attack. But of course, the heart attack comes two minutes into the match. Yeah, so I'm like, oh, there goes that. <laughs> like the iconic Heart Foundation finisher. Here it is. <laughs> yeah, I would. I wouldn't have liked though for uh, for them to win. I don't. I don't like you know the person comes out of mothballs and comes and wins the title. So that you know because the whole. Uh, I usually don't like that either. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and I did not see the iconics winning this. And when they did, I was very happy. And so was the crowd. It was like the crowd was like, holy crap, they did it. That's cool. Yay. Because, cause, you know, I put it in my blog, and you and I have talked about it before. Mm-hmm. I, I think the Iconics are, are they, they actually pay a price for being so good at being characters that mm-hmm. people underestimate how good they are as wrestlers. Because they're, they, I mean, I'm not saying that they're Oscar or anything like that, but they're extremely competent, very good wrestlers that are a tag team and work really well in tandem together. And I think because there's such great personalities and a lot of times, you know, they're selling for, you know, someone that they're pretending they're scared of or whatever, that you don't realize they're really good, too. And, you know, the finish was the way the Iconic should win something like this. You know, all, you know, obviously Sasha and Bailey are fighting with great heart. You know, Nye and Tamina are physically trying to overwhelm people, but Beth and Natty are strong enough to kind of fend that off. So we get to the point where Beth and Natty have kind of taken control of the match. You know, Sasha's kind of uh, been taken out. Beth gets Bailey for the uh, glam slam from the top, which is going to destroy her. And before Beth jumps, uh, Billy reaches up and tags her. So now Billy is the official person in the match. So Beth hits the glam slam, goes for the cover, but the referee doesn't count because he saw Billy tag in. Peyton just 
dives into Beth, knocking her through the ropes. Billy jumps on the destroyed Bailey because she got hit with a glam slam from the top. One, two, three. The Iconics are your new women's tag team champions. And the crowd did go nuts for that. They went, they were like, oh. And again, you had that moment where this is something these two women have dreamed about something like this since they were in high school. You know, they didn't know there was going to be a focus on the women's division like this. They didn't know there was going to be women's tag team titles. But in their hearts, they wanted to have something like this one day. And for them, and they've worked so hard, and they were great characters in NXT. They worked their way up the ladder in NXT, got to the main roster. The main roster didn't seem to know what to do with them for a while. And then finally, they really got to start to show their characters. And then in matches like the Elimination Chamber, they got to show that they can go, too, and that they, they can be devious heels, and they can be funny and entertaining as well as wrestle. And tonight was kind of a crowning moment for them. And the looks on their faces... After the three count, they both kind of burst into tears, which, as heels, you shouldn't do. Yeah, especially okay. Billy, though. She was just, I mean, yeah. Peyton got it back together quick, but Billy yeah. was like, you know, and you know what? I mean, it's fine. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. fine, you know. Because for those characters, they could pl- they could turn that into it. It's not like it's not like Naya and Tamina just start breaking down, crying in the middle of the ring, and you're like, oh, well, there goes that aura. And you could also yeah. look at it like, you know. Not for nothing, yeah, they're heels, but they really didn't do anything heelish in the match. They just fought hard and won. So, you know, if you start crying after... Well, there are no like, real rules, so you can't really do anything Right, heelish. that's what I mean. And it's like, yeah. they really didn't do anything, no chicanery. They were smart. You know, they, they made the blind tag, stole the pin, got the titles. And it's like, that's the kind of thing, even if you're a heel, you could be like, wow, we did it, you know? So it wasn't like, you know, they, they, they kendo sticked everybody and, you know, you know, threw somebody in a leaf chipper, and then they're like... You had dry. five people run out as heaters yeah. to beat up everyone yeah. so they can get the pin. Yeah, they they just, you know, they overcame the odds and won, and they were overcome with emotion, so it was cool. And then we had what was the absolute brilliance. To me, this was the crescendo of the night. This was everything. This gave me the buzz that I got from NXT. This gave me the buzz that I got from New Japan, uh, G1, ROH... Supercard, this was everything wonderful about professional wrestling. Daniel Bryan versus Kofi Kingston for the WWE Championship. This match was incredible and emotional. And, you know, it went back and forth. And Kofi was in jeopardy at certain points. And it looked like Daniel Bryan was going to pull it out. And I love... So, I complained during the build about that moment where Kofi didn't get himself into the championship match that they had to rely on on Woods and, and Big E. I love that tonight Woods and Big E tried to stop Rowan and both got taken out and Kofi went out and was the one that took out Rowan. And then Big and E finished him off. Yeah. So that was great. Uh, you know, Kofi just fighting through everything, the drama from this match. The Daniel Bryan is like a wrestling machine he might be better now than he was five years ago. He played his role perfectly. He did yeah. everything he needed to do to make Kofi's win mean what it meant. And I, and I put this out on, on the Twitters, and I'll read it here. I always put over NXT when they hit perfection. Now it's time to do it for at WWE. Daniel Bryan and, and Kofi was perfect, 100% perfect. Kudos to all. And it was. It was. I agree with you. It was the match of the night. Um, if they ended the show after that, it would have been fine. Obviously not for everybody that still had to come. But it was perfect. I, I honestly can't think of how they could have done it better. The only thing is if they would have played the SOS, the original Kofi Kingston theme, when he won the championship. But that's... No, he's New Day now. He's not... Yeah. I mean, you know, he got to hit... He got to hit Trouble Paradise and SOS, so he got to hit that stuff. But he's New Day now. And that would have been uncool to his brothers that were there for him and brought him the title back. I should have turned on him immediately after that. Oh, Russo, Russo would have had him turn, no oh, doubt. Yeah. But Russo, when Big E had the uh, box with the gift in it, and he was like, after the match, after the match, if that was Russo booking, it, it would have been, been a like... Cobra or something that would have bit him in the face when he opened <laughs> it. <would've> it. Yeah. <laughs> and he would have took the title and left, you know, so... I love, though, he hits the trouble in paradise, he gets the pin, the crowd goes crazy... Xavier and Big E run over to Daniel Bryan's terrible <laughs> recycle championship. They chuck it away and reveal the true WWE championship because Kofi's not going to get that crap hemp title. And he's got his name on it already. Yeah, they because re- they knew. They knew their boy was going to win. And 
the kids jump in the ring and the celebration and they stayed with the celebration. And they had the t the presents with the t-shirts with him as the t-shirts that already had Kofi as the champion on them. They made a, that was a forever true, not just Michael Cole screaming it's a WrestleMania moment. That was a forever true WrestleMania moment that you could put in every bumper from now until the end of time. It was beautiful and wonderful and I was so happy and it was right. Kofi is the champion is right. And no matter what happens from here on out, WrestleMania was worth it because of this moment. Yep. They would have had to go a long way to screw it up after that point. And then Booker T comes down the aisle and he actually had one of the lines of the night. So Samoa Joe versus Rey Mysterio and Rey's hurting. So it was just really kind of a non-match. Joe got the coquina clutch in really quickly, choked Rey out and Booker goes, I came down the aisle for just that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and as it turned out, I was glad it went quick because, you know, there still was a lot more to go. Yes, a lot more. A lot. And now, uh, Roman Reigns versus Drew McIntyre. So, but here's what made me unhappy about this match. You effers... At MetLife, and, and, and to be clear, I'm not sure how many people did it. I and, heard, and, and Mike said, it. Mike said from the press box he couldn't hear anybody booing. So I'm not so sure. It also, it always depends on. What... Go ahead. I'm sorry. It always, it always depends on what section you're in because you hear the noise from the section you're in. So if you were in a section that was heavily cheering for Roman, you wouldn't hear anything but that. But I know somebody. That was in one of the sections that were prominently booing Roman Reigns. And she could not believe it. She was like, there are prominent boos for Roman Reigns going on right now. And That's it's making me angry. So those are just tool fans. I mean, yep. whatever. And, and, you know, we've never gotten good reasons why people boo him to begin with. But, you know, some people swear they have their reasons. Okay, fine, whatever. But once a man, and you didn't know he beat cancer the first time, so okay, I'll give you a break. But how do you boo a guy that just beat cancer that shouldn't even have been on WrestleMania, but luckily, you know, his treatment, you know, put him in a position to be on WrestleMania? Yeah. Hey, I love Drew McIntyre. I'll bet you if you asked Drew McIntyre, he'd be like, I had no problem at all putting Roman over tonight. It was the right thing to do for him and the business. He's a good dude, and it was a feel-good moment. And that's what it should have been, a feel-good moment. He overcame the odds. You know, Drew was beating him up pretty good. Uh, Drew went too far and, and, you know, started saying, I killed your brothers, now I'm going to kill you, or whatever the verbiage was. And that was it. It was like saying, you know, Niagara Falls back in the old Abbott and Costello thing. And Roman powered up, got the pin, and it was a happy, feel-good moment. And thank God we didn't hear the boos when he won the match. But it was exactly what it should have been, in my opinion. Yeah, this was not about... So, to your point, when they broke down, when they told Drew, hey... You're wrestling Roman at WrestleMania, and, you are, and you're going to put him over. His reaction probably was, "Thank you." Yeah, that's a big deal. Thank you. And that, because that would have been my reaction, I've been like, "No problem, Roman. What do you want? What do you want? Because we'll do whatever you want in this match. Because we love having you back, and I'm so happy to do this for you." That would have been my reaction. Mine too. And Drew's a good dude, from what I've heard, so I'm sure it was his as well. And he's certainly someone that loves and understands and appreciates the business. So. And this wasn't about Roman coming back and having a five-star match. This was about a guy showing that there is life. There could be life after the disease. So him just getting back in the ring, and he had the six-man match with the Shield, so he was there was a lot of bells and whistles, and there was a lot of Seth and Dean doing stuff, so Roman could take breaks and sell and lay on the floor. You know, he, Roman definitely had his highlight spot during the match, but it wasn't, he didn't have to wrestle a single match, and they got to do a lot of gaga, which kind of protected the fact that Roman might not be completely at 100% full strength. He's got to get back there. This match was about this man who's overcome so much, who's just gone through so much, literally getting back in the ring at WrestleMania, where no one expected him to be, to have a one on one match, and just to show he could do it, and just have a basic match get the win, have a feel-good moment, and have that moment of, hey, guys, I did it, and I'm back. And I'm a role model, and for all you people struggling with anything out there, lean on me because you can get through what you're struggling through. And so it was bigger than how many stars the match was or how good or bad the match was. It was the symbolism of Roman Reigns one-on-one on the stage of WrestleMania, back in the ring, overcoming. And... 
it delivered everything it was supposed to be. And that's I, my opinion. I agree 100%. It was what it should have been and what it was supposed to be. So, you know, this was probably the last moment of the night where the crowd had some juice. Elias comes out. Well, actually, Elias doesn't come out. We get the video screen yes. of Elias playing drums, Elias playing piano, Elias playing gu- guitar. Except he was live playing guitar. Well, there was uh, there were three different Eliases on the screen, weren't there? I, I think it was, was. I think it was the the drums and the piano were on the screen, and he was live in the ring. So, anyway, so you had Elias and the Elias band. And the crowd starts chanting, we walk with Elias. So he starts playing the guitar to the, you know, the tune they're singing. And then he goes through his thing and he's ready to perform his super concert. And all of a sudden this weird video about Babe Ruth calling his shot yeah. starts playing. And I'm like, all right, where's this going? <laughs> I was too. I was like, what the hell is this? And then that big phony John Cena, who we know is a Tampa Bay Rays fan, former Red Sox fan. Yeah, former Red Sox fan. Who's now a Yankees fan. He's a, he's a bandwagon jumper. He is. Came out to his classic basic thugonomics theme, dressed in the throwback Babe Ruth Yankee jersey with the lock chain, with the word life rings, with the baseball cap on. And he came out for the second year in a row to interrupt Elias. And... He just blistered Elias with a uh, non he was not PG, PG rap. Yeah, he was not PG. Not PG. Nope. But it was really a lot of fun, and the crowd was totally into it. It was a really cool kind of WrestleMania moment. And again, at this point, a couple of years ago with Elias, this would have been something that really annoyed me. Because I'm like, come on. You've got this part-time legend who's killing this guy, who's just obliterating this guy who is someone you're going to rely on to be a star, but Elias has been beaten up like this so many times at this point yeah. that now it just doesn't matter anymore. It is what he is. Yeah, so he... It's so funny, too, because Cena goes, you're not getting the AA tonight, you're getting the FU, and Cole's like, that's the AA, and Graves is like, not tonight, Not Cole. tonight, you dummy, you miss what he's saying. But it was, it was a lot of fun, uh... And then all HBK made his way out to the announce team, which led me to believe that they did something actually very manipulative during this, which was actually really great. It fooled you. I know exactly what you're going to say, and yeah. it fooled you. Yeah, well, I, then I thought about it, and I realized what was coming later, and I knew he that wasn't going to happen. But they did a few things that were really manipulative, which is what you should do in wrestling. So this cats off to them by bringing Shawn Michaels out to announce – so that meant two things. Well, you know, it's might be Triple H's final match. Isn't it appropriate that Sean's involved somehow? Right? Then Triple H's family's at ringside. What we've seen with Ric Flair and other retirement angles and Sean and other retirement angles they've done, the family's always at ringside for those matches so they could have the moment where when the guy loses his career, he can go with his family and they can all hug him and kiss him and have that emotional moment. So Triple H, because I guarantee you he laid all that out. Being the genius he is, knows that we pay attention to this stuff. Well, some of us So he, he put yeah. all the things out there that tell you that a retirement match is going to end in a retirement, and then it didn't. It's called a red herring. Yep. It was, it's, it's, that's what wrestling's about, though. It's about giving you something so you think you know what's going to happen without it being a crazy-ass swerve. But then just turning it on its head a little bit, making you go, oh, wow, they got me. So I enjoyed this match. I did, too. Um, it was all you could expect from, I mean, Triple H, I don't know if he's 50 yet. He's real close. If not, Dave is 50 or more, uh, depending on if you believe that three-year thing. But, I mean, you had two 50, you know, 50-ish guys. It's like, what do you expect? And they did way more than I expect. Some of the stuff Dave did, I was like, when he took that that bomb on the freaking stuff. I'm like, what is wrong with you? And then he bounces off. I'm like, you're a movie star, man. You're, you're a 50-year-old movie star. You don't need to do this. Yeah, Triple H is 49. Yeah. And Dave is at least 50. Yeah, Dave Dave is, is being counted as 50, but he might be older. So it's like, I'm like, the, I, I'm older than them, but even 10 years ago, I wouldn't have done what they were doing. And I'm like, 
you know, one guy's a, a high end executive in a big billion dollar company, and and the other guy's a you know a movie star, and these guys are out there killing each other, and it's like. If again, you know, it's expectations. If you go into this saying, you know, this has to be as good as you know, um, uh, Okada, you know, versus Jay White was last night, then you're just crazy. They're not Okada and Jay White. They're they're two guys that are 50 years old that are going to give you everything they have in a match, and, and they're going to put bells and whistles in it, and they're going to have pliers and a chain, and they're going to have needle nose pliers to pull uh, a ring out of a nose, which was a very cool spot. I love that a lot, and you know, it was exactly. You know what you you shouldn't have expected any more than what you got. So as the match went on, we started to get bigger stuff. You know, like the smashing through the tables and the backdrops off the stairs and the power bombs on the stairs. But I think early on in the match, while on TV it played great, I think in an arena that size they were doing things that were very small. Mm-hmm. So I think in a smaller venue and on TV, that stuff played really well. I think one with the crowd in the state it was in at that point where they kind of expelled all their energy. And two, like him trapping the hands inside the, the the wrench and stomping on the arm, like, and then you know, you know, uh, going after the fingers with the pliers and going after the nose ring with the pliers. I think those, since they were such like TV and small events, that there were probably people that were sitting in the arena going, "What's going on? Yeah. Like, what is he doing right now?" And that is the problem with you know uh, being and in, in the audience of a TV product, and it is a TV yep. product. So I, I think that led to some of it, but boy, when they got to that, there was a lot of drama in this match. You know, the one thing I'll say is Triple H started out so ultra violent with just ripping out the nose ring and you know crushing the fingers and doing. It, it almost felt like Dave when he got control instead of being like I'm going to match your violence, kind of went all right. I'm going to wrestle. Yeah. And you know, so I think you know that's like the one critique I had. You know. I feel like Dave probably should have grabbed the chain and come back and wrapped it around Triple H's head. You know, like but, he just but, did a but bunch you could also look at the storyline, which was you know I want to prove I'm better than you. Yeah, and, 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 and it was you, Triple H who wanted to know holds barred. Yeah, so. and Triple H is the one that wanted to get revenge and violence because of what he did to Ric Flair. So yeah, I can understand why Dave's like, no, I just want to show you I'm better. I've always been better than you. Even though I've beaten you three times and you've never right. beaten me. Right, which we forgot all about. Yeah. Because that was the weird thing, because Sean kept on trying to allude to Dave needs to prove that he's better. It's like, well, hasn't he? When they were both in their primes. I don't remember that. (laughs) (laughs) Won all the matches. Here, you want some light sticks? I'm a sexy boy. And then we had the, the moment that could have been the turn of the night, which did not happen. You know, both guys have been pounding each other. They're beaten down. The pedigree has been escaped. The Batista bomb has been escaped. You know, Batista has the sledgehammer. So Triple H might be in serious trouble. Batista's getting up to his feet with the sledgehammer. And here comes the nature boy. What's he going to do? Was he in on, uh, was he in on the attack or was it really an attack? That was, it was and, really and, an attack. And that's, you know, a story that I talked about weeks ago. Yep. I want to know. I, w- was it real? Or was he working? And we haven't seen Flair since, so that and that's good booking. It's like you just have to wonder because he hasn't been there to say anything, you know. So Flair slides in a second sledgehammer to Triple H, runs around to the other side of the ring, distracts Batista long enough so Triple H can get the drop the drop on him, and he came He's flying with that. I mean, he came flying in the air off the uh, the, the barricade or the the, the stair, the Superman sledgehammer punch. That was really cool. I mean, he didn't really yeah. hit it, but it's a good thing he didn't because you know. Oh, yeah, you don't want to really hit Dave Batista in the head with a sledgehammer. No, but it was a really cool spot. And knocks him out and hits the pedigree to finish him off, and Triple H lives to fight another day, and Ric Flair gets his revenge on Batista for Batista's betrayal of him. Right, and Dave Batista is the guy leaving the territory, so he shouldn't be taking somebody's career if he's if his yep. is over, too. So, and, and you know what? If you go outside the ring and Dave just wanted to have that one fun last feud, he had, he got it, and it was great. So good for him. And Triple H's peck held up, which is wonderful, you know, because that, you know, who knows, you know, but uh, a peck you never know, and I haven't heard anything from the locker room, so it's all good. And, you know, again, I thought with this match, it was everything you could have realistically expected it to be. And if you expected something different, then you're nuts. To their credit, this could have fit right in with the matches they had, what, what was it, 10, 12 years ago at this point? It was like, what, well, WrestleMania 21, it was like 14 years yeah. ago. It was like 2005. You know, I thought Dave looked great. 
you know, Dave looked like Dave Batista. Like you didn't watch this and go. Luckily, oh, man. he didn't look like Dave Scher. <laughs> yeah, you didn't watch this and go, "Oh man, I remember when he was really the animal." He looked like Batista. Yeah, he did. He has more ink on his back now, though. Yeah, and the the sun around his stomach is now this yeah. whole like wing yeah, thing. It's a solar system, yeah. Yeah, so uh, we get the Ron Simmons appearance as uh, the B team is modeling Daniel Bryan and still champion of the planet shirts. And Ron Simmons comes out to do the damn because they look like idiots in the shirts because Daniel Bryan didn't win. And that leaves the JBL coming to ringside to call the final match of Kurt Angle against Baron Corbin. Uh, it was painless. It was six minutes. Uh, I'll say that. I won't, Kurt, I won't say it's painless. Kurt looked kind of pained in spots. But yeah, I, he hit the moonsault. Didn't, didn't hit it, hit it, but he did it. And I was kind of surprised. I felt like Kurt looked better than he has in, than, in any of his recent Raw matches. There was a little bit more of a pep in his step tonight. Like, he, did, he didn't seem... And again, Baron's a slower guy, so it wasn't like Gable had to slow down ten notches so Kurt can kind of look like Kurt. You know, Baron can kind of move at a pace that Kurt looks like he's moving quickly. Right. But, you know, Kurt threw the Germans, Kurt hit the angle slam, Kurt got him in the ankle up, Kurt kind of got psyched up because, you know... "Quote unquote," the crowd was oh, really. Oh, we forgot. We forgot up. to mention Doctor Hall and Doctor Nash in the back oh, of the yeah. SNL guys in the mortuary. Yeah, the, <laughs> yeah. Alexa tells the SNL guys she apologizes for what Roman did to them. Uh, for what uh, for what Braun did to them, she said, "We're going to take care of you, and you guys are in good hands." And Scott Hall and Kevin Nash come out dressed as doctors. <laughs> and Nash I popped for that. I thought that was pretty good. Exam. Yeah, I thought that was good. That was funny. Hey, you don't say it's fake. Yeah. <laughs> Unless you're Ronda. Yeah, that's true. And that's the other thing about the Ronda angle that I guess we'll get to, I'll say that now and then we'll move on, but you do this whole angle where I'm real, I'm real, I'm real, I'm real, and then you wrestle a regular match. Yeah, then you're wrestling. So what's you're not, the point? Yeah. And back to the, the Kurt, you know, Kurt obviously yeah. lost the match, misses the moonsault, end of days, uh, you know, Baron wins. And uh, people are losing their shit, they're writing me and they're like, oh my god, I can't believe it. It's like, Kurt is 50 and he's retiring. Baron Corbin now, in, in a lot of the ways, you know, Roman, or excuse me, Brock Lesnar, uh, you know, could, could have said, I ended the streak and did. You know, now Baron Corbin, I ended the career of Kurt Angle. Now, will Baron Corbin ascend to top heel status? I don't know. But at least, at least the guy leaving the territory gave the heat to the guy that's staying behind and people are going to hate Baron Corbin even more now for beating Kurt Angle in his last match. And that's what you're supposed to do. Corbin's going to walk out tomorrow night and it's going to be like the Roman Reigns treatment after yep. he beat The Undertaker. Yep. And that's good. And He's a heel. <laughs> so. Yep. Uh, so then we had the Intercontinental Championship match, Bobby Lashley versus the Demon, Finn Balor. Uh, the Demon comes out. Cool entrance. Bobby Lashley had some weird contacts in, I guess, to counteract the demon. I don't this one, felt, story this one felt rushed to me, though. It, it, definitely, it was. It definitely felt like they knew they were behind, and maybe the tri- I, I heard the Triple H Batista match might have went too long. But yeah, this was rushed, and it's like at the end of the day, they could have had a great match. But the demon, if he's going to come out, has to win, or the demon's dead forever. And the demon won. Yep. And you know. The demon can- and they played off of the uh, Baron Corbin, which was the last appearance of the demon, where the demon just squashed Corbin. He started out at 100 miles an hour, and then Lashley cut him off, and then Lashley stole Big E's spear through the ropes, yeah. and then he hit him with another spear. So there was a really believable near fall because, would, would even though we were getting all happy endings basically all night, would you believe that Vince would beat the demon at WrestleMania? Sure. Sure. Yeah. So you know that was really believable, and the, the guys executed it perfectly. Then the demon f- powered out, hit a power bomb on Bobby Lashley, hit the coup de gras, one, two, three, and new intercontinental champion, Finn Balor. And it was quick. You know, yep, so. Short and sweet. Alexa comes out, uh, announces the crowd, and then we get a seven second. Uh, Damn not no. you! Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Every time you mention Alexa, she, she mentions you back. Yeah, we got the dance off. I don't know why. Um, unless they they had timing issues where like they needed to get Charlotte in the helicopter and they weren't ready, I don't know. But whatever it was, 
I didn't need to see that at this point. I don't think anybody. I mean, it might have got a little chuckle in the crowd, but it added like five minutes to, to when they could get out of there. Well, I love they used King Kong Bundy time from WrestleMania 1, though. They're like, it's a seven-second dance break, and it went on for like 30 seconds. Yeah. So it was what it was. I, yeah. Okay. I, we, whatever. And then it's main event time. Um, I did love Charlotte having her version of the 1985 Great American Bash helicopter entrance. I thought that was really cool. That was cool. Um, you know, you had Joan Jett and the Blackhearts play Ronda to the ring. You know, and, and I like the way they did that because they, you know they, they did it so Joan just starts playing, so it's not like yep. you're going to boo her because Ronda's a heel. But even so, the crowd was gone at this point. Yeah, yeah they for the most part, anyway, you're right. they weren't booing or really cheering at all at this point. Like until the they all three women got in the ring and they announced all three. When Becky got announced, there was a Becky, Becky, Becky chant, but. It didn't really last. Um, and like we talked about it earlier. We were on to the main event. It was physical. The women attacked. It and and just the, reason, felt... the thing I liked about it was it looked like they were all in a fight trying yes. to win. Uh, but it, it was not a mat. It wasn't like, you know, like we watched Johnny Gargano and Adam Cole, two out of three falls, and it looked like a fight, and it also was a match. This just was kind of like, you know, Whoever's in the ring now is going to pound the other one until someone throws that one out, and then the next. I mean, it was just it was it, it kind of was by the num physical and by the numbers, I guess is the best way. I go and it. it never really felt like a real story was unfolding based on the things that we'd seen previously. It was just like right. who, who who could whoever could get like the pin at the right time was going to win, and as it turned out, we didn't even get a good pin. Right, because early on in the match, you never even felt like. We had that moment where they were all sizing each other up and who was going to attack who first. And I'm like, oh, how's this going to go? So that was cool. But you never really tapped into the fact that Becky really wanted at Ronda and Ronda really wanted at Becky. And really that they both at one point felt that, felt that Charlotte was a shoehorn. Like none of that actually played out during the match. And when that's a lot of your build, that needs to be part of the match story too. And it never really happened. And I also think one of the reasons why the crowd had trouble rallying is Becky never really got a clear advantage at any point during the match. There was never a, like a sequence where Becky was really rocking and rolling on both other women, where the crowd could really get momentum behind Becky, and then Becky gets cut off. It was more like Becky gets a couple moves, she gets thrown out. She recovers. Ronda gets a couple moves, she gets thrown out. She recovers. Charlotte gets a couple moves, she gets thrown out. She recovers. And so on and so forth. And finally, it looked like they were going to do the thing we talked about, which is Charlotte gets thrown through a table and gets taken out, and then we get the Becky and Ronda face off, and this is how it's going to end. And I don't know if it's because other things ran long. I don't know if they, you know the timing was off, but this was just a flash sequence. Charlotte rolls out of the ring after going through the table. We get the really quick Becky and Ronda stare down. Bing bang boom. You Becky, get the Piper's uh, pit, but Ronda roll, Becky uh, rolls, Becky through. rolls through. Clearly, and when they called the pin, I was like, in real, and I didn't go back and watch the replay other than what they It looked showed. like the shoulder was up. Clearly, like on one, her shoulder was like, you know, four inches off the ground. Or off the mat, excuse me. Yeah, and again, the crowning wrestle, and there was no pop for the win. Like, none. No, not really. At least and it didn't come across on TV if it was. Yeah, and the crowning WrestleMania moment, again, if you look at the WrestleMania moments, and Kofi had it tonight. You look at the WrestleMania moments that really ascended someone to the top. They won definitively with their finish, right? Steve Austin hit the stunner. He didn't roll up the rock. You know, uh, it wasn't a back door. They went through the front door. Yeah. You know, Hulk Hogan hit the leg drop. Randy Savage hit the elbow. The Warrior hit the splash, right? Everyone. Brock hit gets, the F, you know, the F5 after 50 Germans. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Everyone that kind of wins at WrestleMania and ascends to the top. Well, even Brock against Kurt, he hit the F5 to beat him. Yeah. They botched the shooting star, but they recovered into the F5. Like, you ascend, you have that moment where you are the true victor at WrestleMania. Boom! The crowd gets to, to, to get swept up in your finish. They know that you're finished. They know you're going to win. One, two, three, you ascend. Now you're at this other level. Becky kind of 
did what she's been doing this entire time. She kind of slipped in the back door. This this felt a lot like when when Roman finally beat Brock. You know, it was kind of like a back door. Well, you know, he, he kind of poached the title instead of winning the title, and then, and then the, when you add in the fact that you know she rolled through Piper's pit and didn't even have her shoulders pinned, now what will they do with that? It, it was, if that was intentional, it was a really dumb idea, uh, in my opinion, because it, it, like you said, it invalidates Becky's win even more. And if it ends up it was just a screw up, then you know, then what do you do? Do you, do you acknowledge it? You know, if, if Rhonda's taking time off, you know, obviously she'd have to address that when she comes back. And if she's not taking time off, obviously she'll have to address it tomorrow, right? Here's why I don't get the screw up though, because Rhonda got up immediately and yelled at the ref. My shoulder was up. Yeah. If that was supposed to be the finish, one, two, three, with no controversy, Rhonda probably would have just been shocked and rolled out of the ring. Yeah. So the ref probably screwed up. No, I don't think the ref screwed up. I think. That was the finish. Oh, jeez. Because even in a moment of candor, Corey Graves said, well, I want a more definitive finish at WrestleMania. Yeah. And the announcers kind of went back and forth arguing, did she get the shoulder up? I don't know. I don't know. And Corey's like, no, she did. And then they showed the replay, and she clearly – it wasn't yeah. that she got the shoulder up. It's that it, it was wasn't a, down on the first count. When well, the, it went wh- down, and it came right up. Yeah. So, like, when he hit one, the shoulder was not on the ground yep. or on the mat. And I, I have a feeling if – that was not supposed to be the finish. They would have been screaming in everyone's headset, "Just say she pinned her." Yeah. It's, I, so I guess we'll see on Raw tomorrow. But yeah. if they purposely ended with a goofy finish, then that's a, that's not how you end WrestleMania, especially no. on a show where everything you know was largely definitive. And the one thing that should have been definitive was was Becky beating Ronda. Because right away, my first thought was. Oh, they're giving her the Brock treatment where she can now, you know, go take time off and say she never really lost. And who does that help? Nobody. It's like, oh, so Becky, Becky's the dual champion now. She didn't beat Charlotte, and she really didn't beat Ronda either, and she has both belts. So I hope that's not where it's going, but it sure seems like it's where it's going. Yeah, I mean, we'll see. I mean, if they retcon tomorrow to be like, no, nope, uh, Ronda was definitively pinned, and she's just a whiner. Again, with our eyes, we certainly saw something different, so it's hard for them to do that. And that's the one problem with all the HD cameras and the 55 camera angles. And You can't get away with stuff you could have gotten away with 20 years ago where they just never would have showed that angle again. Right. But, um, yeah, I thought the the three-way for the women were, was a little underwhelming. Not a bad match, yeah. not bad at all, but I had higher hopes and higher expectations for it. Right. So it, it let me down a little bit, and the finish certainly let me down. One thing that came in from Chris Decker that uh, I'm curious what you think, and then we'll call it a night, because we've had a long weekend. He said, do you think Mania was booked as well as it was, especially with Seth, Kofi, and Becky winning, to try and prevent the after Mania Raw crowd from taking over the show tomorrow night, which is now almost tonight? I I, um, I, I don't know. That, fin- that finish could get people pretty angry tomorrow, depending on where they go with it. We'll see. Yeah, I mean, Vince has never shown... A concern. They've basically just chalked it up to here's the weirdo after WrestleMania crowd. They're a bunch of dummies. <laughs> they've literally said they've literally done show. Yeah. They did a show on WWE Network. Like these people are crazy. And they <laughs> mock him at the start of Raw every year after the after yeah the, yeah they always do. So Vince has never really cared about the reaction the night after WrestleMania. So I don't think he would. He he only caved to the fans two times. Brian. One was Daniel Bryan, and that was they really had to go at it for a long time to get that. And the other was when he actually pulled back on Roman Reigns' push for a little while, which is what made the people think if we keep booing him, he'll stop getting pushed. Because Vince did it for a while. Vince said, all right, we're going to scale this back for a little bit. And that was probably the biggest mistake Vince made. Um, So Vince doesn't really show an inclination to care about how, especially the night after WrestleMania, that crowd's going to react. They just they they do the counter thing. This is bizarre world. Yeah, up is down and down is up. So I think they I just think in this case, the creative team made all the right calls and said, "Here's the right thing to do for WrestleMania." That's my gut feeling too. That at this point in time, they're just like, you know what? Let's just do it. Let's let's do what should be done and do the right thing. You know, I, I'm more inclined to think that they kind of know maybe they hosed up the build a little bit, so they went, let's not get cute tonight. Yeah. Yeah, because we already have some aggravated people. 
And that was that was your WrestleMania. That was your WrestleMania, and that ends uh, that ends our weekend. It's eleven o'clock here, so it's two in the morning back east, and this will be up in about five ten minutes. And uh, if you're still up, God bless you for for listening. So I'm really glad I took tomorrow off. I bet you are. So for Mike, I'm Dave. I want to thank everybody who checked the site out over the weekend. I want to thank everybody who contributed. We've had reams and reams and reams of coverage. Uh, I couldn't be prouder. Every year at this time, uh, I'm humbled and proud of the job that the team here does. Everybody steps up and delivers the the best coverage anywhere, in my opinion, of, of WrestleMania weekend. And WrestleMania, I tried to get out of it. You couldn't. Yeah, and you. I gave. I even told you as Shane McMahon was coming out, you should go eat for a half hour. I'll tell you when to come back. Well, no, the show itself was fine. I just yeah. tried to get the coverage. I know. Yeah. So. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. Um, Mike Johnson appreciates it, too. Uh, I, I have a really good feeling that the bet that Mike Epson Hart and I made with Mike Johnson about him being exhausted, uh, I think we're going to win that one. We're, he's, we're the winners. We already won, actually, but there's no way he won't be exhausted after today. So we win, as usual. Um, so thanks a lot. We'll be back with our regular craziness uh, next week. So... And tomorrow and the next day. So, oh no, actually we're scheduled to start the FMB in 12 minutes. That's right. We're, we're going into Saturday morning right now. So for Mike, I'm Dave. Take care, everybody. Thanks for your support and we'll be back next time. Have a good one. Take care. Happy WrestleMania, everybody.